Hi guys, this is Skithicon here, and we are already on episode 7 of Let's Play Sayano Uta. Last time we had a rather fun episode with an overly long sex scene, which um, featured Koji getting trapped at the bottom of a well, which is, you know, fun stuff, fun fun, great, all around for everyone. And we also saw Yo getting turned into whatever Saya is. So this episode, let's keep moving onward. Let's see what happens with Koji. Maybe we'll see more of Yo. And of course, our protagonist Fuminori. And Saya too. So let's load up. He has been buried alive. His whole world is the silence and cold of the grave. Ever since his voice gave out and he lost the strength to scream, no coherent thought has run through Koji's mind. Perhaps his brain was being merciful by shutting down. By forgetting who he is and why he's trapped in this dark well, he is able to ignore the freezing cold that is gradually draining his life. Instead, he dreams. Images flash before his eyes, random unconnected scenes from his twenty-odd years of life. Not all are of happy times, there are sad, painful memories as well, but even these are merciful, for they are pleasantly warm compared to the death that is encroaching upon him. He dreams of mountains. His older brother had taken him hunting for insects when he was a child. They'd sealed the butterflies that wouldn't fit in their cage in a plastic bag, and later found the bag filled with the wings of suffocated butterflies. He dreams of his lover. So a thing that I heard back when I was researching Silent Hill 2 a bunch w was um, in Japanese culture you see butterflies used as the symbol of life really often, so that is a nice symbolic grim image that uh, this game brings up right there. Anyway, he dreams of his lover. They'd met at a mixer, where he'd been the only one to realize that she couldn't hold her liquor. After she'd had too much to drink, he'd looked after her while she vomited in, while she vomited in the back alley. They toasted each other with canned juice, and then... He dreams that he is diving into the black depths of the night sea. When he reaches the bottom, he looks up to see the moon shining through the surface of the water. As he gazes up at the circle of light, entranced by its roundness and brilliance, he listens absently to the distant sound of a car. Something still conscious within him tells him that this dream is wrong. Have I ever gone diving in the ocean at night before? The dots begin to connect in his mind, forming a barrier to separate his dreams from reality. What is bothering him? Of course, the car. He can hear the sound of an engine coming from far away. The engine noise gradually changes to a low wide length and abruptly gives way to silence, followed by the sound of a door opening and closing. It sounds like someone drove up and got out of a car. This isn't a dream. These sounds are real. Understanding comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea and that circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the well. The sun has already risen, and someone is right outside with a car. Have you guys ever slept in the cold? Like, um, actual, very real cold. Um, one time I slept in my car outside a game store because I wanted to play Magic the Gathering in the morning and didn't feel like driving 20 miles home and then driving 20 miles back in the morning. Anyway, it was a particularly cold day, and I ended up with um, the bones in my legs feeling very cold, and even after my um, fleshy bits had all warmed up, I could feel the bones just emanating cold from inside my legs, and wow, that was unpleasant. I did not know it was possible to be that cold. I figure Koji is probably going through something similar. I still won. 
at magic that day, though, so you know. It was worth it. Anyway, anyway. Dumb story aside, back to Saya. The last piece of the puzzle falls into place, and he becomes Tono Koji once more. Help me, Koji shouts, surprised by how easily his voice emerges. Perhaps he's desperate enough to subconsciously block out the pain of his raw throat. Hey, I'm down here in the well. Help me. He keeps screaming with all of his might. Soon the echoes in the cramped well become deafening, and he is no longer sure if his screams have meaning or if he's just howling wordlessly. Nevertheless, he continues. His only desire is to be heard, so that whoever is out there will know that he is dying at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is not long, but it feels like an eternity when spent at the boundary of hope and despair. Soon, the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down into the well. Tono, are you alive? It's a woman. Although her voice is not familiar, Koji has heard it somewhere before. For some reason, however, he can't remember who it belongs to. Just hold on, I'll get you out of there. The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light to a perfect circle. Fear of being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic, but his reason has recovered enough for him to resist the urge. She said she's going to get me out, he reminds himself. I haven't been abandoned. While waiting, he gingerly tests out his body, which he had forgotten all about until now. His joints ache and his fingers and toes are numb, but nothing is completely immovable. Though exhausted, he's definitely still in one piece. After some time, the silhouette reappears at the top of the well. Are you hurt? Can you climb a rope on your own? No, I don't think so. Koji lacks the confidence to attempt such a feat with his fingers barely moving. Mm. Oh well, I'm coming down. After a brief pause, the owner of the voice tosses a knotted climbing rope into the well. Have you guys figured out who it is yet? He grabs the rope as soon as it reaches him, its definite presence filling him with true relief. Finally free from his despair, he is able to start asking questions. Specifically, who is his savior? The rope shakes as the woman climbs carefully down the ladder, the beam from the floodlight slung over her shoulder pushing back the shadow cast by her body. She's soon standing in the same mud as Koji, and he finds himself face to face with... Doctor? Were you expecting someone else? Koji couldn't have imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tanbo Ryoko, neurosurgeon at the Tokyo University Medical Center. So we find out here that she's actually a neurosurgeon too, not just uh, handling psychiatric business, which is... It strikes me as rather unorthodox, but that is very cool. That makes her a lot cooler. Um, surgery is... Or neurosurgery is pretty much the most competitive field in surgery in general, so that's um, a rather big accomplishment. Got a really smart doctor here. Instead of a white gown and tight skirt, she's wearing a heavy leather jet leather coat, denim jeans, and boots with no heel. Her practical clothes make it clear that she expected to end up hiking through the mountains. She's carrying not a flashlight, but an all-purpose lamp that can be toggled between a large electric floodlight and smaller side-mounted fluorescent lights. It's obviously survival gear rather than the sort of thing you'd find in an emergency kit. You look awful, Dr. Tanbo says wryly as she looks Koji up and down. Here, drink this. She pulls a flask out of her pocket and hands it to him. Don't chug it. Go slow, taking small sips. It should help a little. Thank you. Walking around with a flask is like something a middle-aged alcoholic man would do. 
Maybe Koji's just old-fashioned, but he can't help but think it's not the sort of item that a young female doctor should be carrying. Cute. Nevertheless, he unscrews the cap and takes a swig, and struggles to keep from coughing as the potent liquid sears his tongue. What is this? Spiritus Vodka. It's good as an analeptic or disinfectant, and also does a fine job of setting certain things on fire. If you guys are unfamiliar with the Spiritus brand, it is a 95% uh, alcohol vodka. For those unfamiliar with alcohol in general, typical vodka is some 40%, so um, that is very strong. We really do have a probable alcoholic in Ryoka, for that to be your flask beverage of choice. Her straightforward, no-nonsense tone makes it clear that she's quite serious. Koji can only gape at the doctor, the dark smile on her face doing little to ease his confusion. Is she really Dr. Tanbo Ryoka? There's no trace of the bookish, mild-mannered doctor Koji met at the hospital. Her expression is now set in a hard mask, and her eyes are sharp and wary. In the darkness at the bottom of the well, it is possible, however unlikely, that the change in her features is caused by the ominous shadows cast by her lamp. It's not so easy, however, to explain the change in her demeanor. Oh, why are you here? You're the one who called me, aren't you? Ryoko replies brusquely, glaring at Koji like she would at a student who just said something foolish. I got a strange message from someone who's off looking for a missing person, but neither he nor his friend answers when I try to call back. Am I supposed to think everything's fine? No. Although Koji still doesn't understand why she acted so quickly, it's a different part of what she just said that seizes his attention. Wait, what about Scuba? You called Scuba Yo too? I did, but she didn't pick up either. To be honest, I figured you were both corpses already. How grim. That's right, he was almost killed and at the hands of the man whom he'd believed was his best friend all along. Anger and frustration well up inside him. He can't forgive Fuminori's betrayal, nor can he forgive himself for his foolishness. And now he has no idea if Tsukubayo is safe. Fuminori tried to kill Koji. Could he have done the same to... Calm down, why don't you? Ryoko says irritably without even looking at him. Getting all pissed off here won't solve anything. If you thought something was wrong, Koji says to her back, then you must have called the police, right? The police? Still engrossed in her examination of the walls, Ryoko laughs scornfully at the idea. So you still think this mess can be cleaned up like that, do you? What's that supposed to mean? Starting to get annoyed by her overbearing attitude, Koji is about to demand answers when she cuts him off with a gesture and shines her light at a corner of the well. You didn't notice this, Tonokun. Hmm? In the light of the lamp, Koji sees that some of the stones are clearly different than the rest of the wall. This must be what Ryoko was looking for while ignoring him. Huh? No, there wasn't enough light to see. Ryoko's gaze moves slowly along the wall, finally coming to rest on a gap between two of the stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach into open-handed. You sure picked the right well to fall down, Ryoko says with a grim smile. Like they say, expect the unexpected. She wastes no time in thrusting her hand into the opening. Hot. After she feels around for a few seconds, Koji hears the thunk of something solid coming together behind the wall. 
Sensei. Doctor? Ryoko pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones a gentle push. With the rumble of weights shifting, the stone slides smoothly back into the wall. So that's how he fooled me. I had no idea this was here the last time I came. You've been here before. Koji wants answers, but Ryoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her floodlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into the mountain. I'm going on ahead, Tonokun. You'd better stay here. Her warning is simple and utterly devoid of warmth. Considering his options, Koji looks from the tunnel to the rope and back again. He's practically sweating now thanks to the nearly 200 proof vodka he just drank, but although feeling has returned to his fingers, he still doesn't have the strength to climb the rope. That said, the mere thought of being left alone again in the well makes him shiver. I'll go too. Please take me with you. Uh, have it your way. Ryoko steps into the tunnel without looking back, and Koji doesn't hesitate to follow her. You were pretty different the last time we met, Koji says sarcastically, following Ryoko as she moves cautiously down the tunnel with her light leading the way. This isn't the hospital, and you're not my patient. This service doesn't come with a smile. So this is who you really are. I wonder, does it matter? Ryoko suddenly stops and stares at the floor. When Koji looks over her shoulder, he sees a dust-covered rope lying coiled up in the middle of the path. What is it? Something left behind by the last guy who came down that well. Yoko picks up the rope, examines it, and hands it to Koji. It's about twice as long as my rope. It has a knot in it, and both ends have been severed. They were connected before, making it a circle. Huh? You loop one end of the circle around something topside, then use the rest to climb down into the well. When you're at the bottom, you cut the circle open and pull the whole rope in with you, leaving behind no trace of your descent. Yoko shines her light down the tunnel, revealing that it ends in a closed wooden door about 10 meters ahead. That's how he avoided detection after hiding here. He really got me good. Doctor, you said you've been here before. Yeah, you and Sakisaka-kun aren't the only ones, Ryoko says dryly. I checked out Ogai's cabin a while back. Badass! There's uh, a nice looking shotgun there. As Ryoko speaks, she opens her coat and pulls out something that she had hanging underneath it. If there aren't any other exits, then he's still behind that door. She looks really good in this shot, too. Yeah, I really like Ryoko. At first, Koji thinks that she's holding a steel pipe. Amazed that she would be carrying a weapon, Koji looks closer and is appalled when he realizes what it really is. It's a gun. And not one of those sleek handguns that he's seen in the movies, but a double-barreled shotgun. The stock in most of the barrels have been sought off for easier concealment, making it appear even more terrifyingly brutal. <laughs> what is that? So panicked. A 12-gauge shotgun, Ryoko explains blandly, as though naming a brand of cigarettes. I don't have a permit for it, and cutting it down like this is also illegal. Any other questions? What are you planning to do with that? So here's a fun story. Um, some time ago, 
I transferred my gun collection over to a friend because of the whole being suicidal and sticking guns in my mouth thing. And um, with short-barreled guns being illegal, um, one guy at the gun store where I was doing the transfer on purpose, just for a laugh, measured the length of the rifle incorrectly so that it was shorter than it was, meaning he measured uh, just the barrel rather than the full length of the gun. And he was all, oh, dude, this is short-barreled. I'm going to have to uh, report you to the cops for owning this. And it was a fun time and laughs all around, and I enjoyed this. In conclusion, the end. That's my story on short-barreled guns. All right. Ryoko looks over her shoulder and throws Koji her most chilling smile yet. When I first learned what Ogai was doing, I was a model citizen. I'd never even gotten a ticket. The woman whom Koji had thought was just a normal doctor waves her sawed-off shotgun menacingly as she continues, her tone sharp yet self-deprecating. If I'd had this back then, I probably would have been able to kill Ogai then and there. If I had, you kids might not have been dragged into this disaster. I feel bad about that, really. Koji listens in silence, helpless to do anything but watch as understanding moves farther and farther out of his grasp. She looks completely manic in that shot. In other words, everything I do from now on is to clean up this mess that you and your friends have stepped in. Remember that, and don't ask any unnecessary questions. Got it? Koji's only choice is to nod weakly in response. With the light in her left hand and the shotgun in her right, Ryoko walks up to the door and takes a deep breath. Then she kicks the door open, putting her full weight behind the blow. With a disappointingly feeble sound, the door breaks off its hinges and falls into the room. I like that there's a Star of David here. Jews are uh, everywhere. Gotta watch out for them. I'm Jewish too, so I'm allowed to make that joke, you know. Just uh, to throw the goyim off my track. In the beam of Ryoko's light, dust billows into the air like white smoke. The room is large, probably at least 35 square meters in size. Koji's first impression is of an operating theater that was turned into a storage room. The tiled floor is set with drainage grates, and there's no mistaking the movable operating table sitting in the middle of the room. One of the walls is covered with cabinets containing enamelware and drugs, while the opposite walls stand a writing desk and bookshelves. Even Koji can recognize that much. The mysterious objects cluttering the tables and shelves, however, are beyond his comprehension. Mirrors delicately engraved with complex patterns, grotesque statues and masks that must have been left behind by a race of savages, tapestries woven in nauseating arrays of color, a crystal ball the size of an infant's head. They're probably all antiques, but there's one thing that they definitely have in common. Every one of them is so loathsome and foul that Koji feels sick just looking at it. You guys remember the books that we saw at, um... Ogai's house earlier, the Necronomicon, and um, I was going to say Similarian, but no, that's the Lord of the Rings lore book. I was, uh, Voynich Manuscript, that's it. And some other one I don't remember. Okay, let's go on. It's as though they were designed for the sole sinister purpose of immortalizing their creator's hatred of the world. Oh, that's pretty badass. Rare-looking books of the sort that were in Ogai's Tokyo home are piled here and there, and on one of the shelves are stacked some scrolls that look to be made of some kind of sheepskin or papyrus. Whatever it is, it's not paper. Finally, there are the indecipherable chalk patterns and symbols filling every available space on the walls. 
Even the two sliding blackboards are completely covered in strange, unreadable scribblings. Just looking at them is making Koji dizzy. Don't look, Ryoko snaps at him. Listen, don't move, and whatever you do, don't touch anything. Even if something draws your attention, don't look at it. If you see something that feels wrong, stare at your shoes right away. Got it? Yeah. He can't, uh, just go grasping all this Lovecraftian paranormal stuff, or, um, there's gonna be some good mind break. Ryoko switches from the floodlight to the fluorescent lamp, then sets the light on a nearby table where it can illuminate the whole room. She then holsters her shotgun only to pull out an even more confusing set of tools. A digital camera, and a can of spray paint. She gives the spray can in her left hand a good shake, switches the camera in her right hand on, and steps into the room while looking at the camera's side-mounted screen. After methodically recording the symbols on the walls and blackboards, she immediately begins to cover them in layers of black spray paint. Uh, doctor. Lesson 1. Never look at strange designs or read anything written in unusual languages, like Latin. Have you guys heard that one joke? Uh, why, is Latin, why is Latin a dead language? It's probably because they just kept accidentally summoning demons in everyday conversation. Okay. Use a camera to record them for later examination, then use paint or something to destroy the real thing. Now that she mentions it, Koji realizes that she's only looking at the screen of her camera, and even then only in short glimpses, and never directly at any of the drawings. He understands what she's saying, but it still doesn't make any sense. Why do you have to... Now that you've come this far, you'd better shut up and listen for your own good. Things like crystal balls and mirrors are dangerous. Anything can happen if you break them, so it's best to cover them with a cloth or paint over them for the time being. This is cool. Such a paranormal investigator. Koji begins to fear that this doctor might be even crazier than Fuminori. Despite the burst of energy he received from the vodka, Koji is still exhausted from having spent the night at the bottom of a well. The fear is affecting his body, making him dizzy and nauseous. The uh, spray paint fumes probably aren't helping with that either. Soon the walls are covered in black paint and the stale air is thick with the smell of turpentine. That should do it for now, Ryoko says with relief, then tosses the empty can aside and puts away her video camera. What happened to Ogai? Koji asks, supporting himself against a nearby table. Hmm? Oh, he was over there. Without stopping her examination of the papers on the writing table, Ryoko nonchalantly points to a Chinese-style screen standing in one corner of the room. He was there. Her clinical choice of tense makes the truth clearer than any words can. The urge to see for himself is irresistible. Koji staggers across the room to the screen, taking the utmost care not to look at the scaly octopus thing that is painted on it. Behind the screen is a large easy chair. Although he's never met the man before, Koji is fairly sure that the person sitting in it is Ogai Masahiko. Spooky. Ogai's corpse must have shrunk significantly while drying in this sealed, undiscovered chamber. The skeleton is barely the size of a child's, with only the business suit hanging from the bones offering any hint of Ogai's former stature. His empty eye sockets and wide open jaw are filled with darkness, the same darkness that surrounded Koji at the bottom of the well. Compared to those gaping voids, the tiny hole in Ogai's right temple is almost demure. The small revolver he must have used to kill himself is still clenched in his dangling right hand. Next to Ryoko's shotgun, it would probably look like a child's toy. Ryoko must have noticed Ogai's corpse when she was spraying paint on the walls. 
Having gotten beyond surprise by now, Koji is instead impressed by Ryoko's ability to keep working next to a corpse without batting an eyelash. He wonders why he keeps meeting people who are totally crazy. To be fair, being comfortable around uh, dead or dying people is probably a useful thing if you're going hardcore into the medical field. If it weren't for her, Koji reminds himself with a bitter smirk. He would have ended up joining this mummified corpse here, and no one would ever have found him. Koji's vision suddenly dims. He's pushed himself too hard, and the spiritist vodka can't help him anymore. He collapses to the floor, unable to hang on to his slipping consciousness, and the last thing he sees are Ogai Masahiko's gaping eye sockets staring at him. When he awakens, Koji finds himself lying on something dry and soft. A bed is a bed, he thinks to himself, even one that smells of mold and dust, and especially after having slept in cold mud all night. There are no lights hanging from the ceiling, but the soft, warm light of a lamp fills the room. A room devoid of furnishings. Koji realizes that he's in Ogai's cabin in the ground floor bedroom that he'd searched before getting pushed into the well. You're awake. When Koji turns his head to face the voice, he sees Ryoko sitting in a chair against the wall, expressionlessly studying the pile of documents on the ground in front of her. On the table in front of her, that is. She must have brought them up from Ogai's underground lab. As she examines the papers by the light of the lamp, she occasionally takes bites of the sandwich she has in her free hand. Isn't that just her right hand? Not her free hand? I mean, to have a free hand, you'd have to be American. Ha. Ha ha. I've got two free hands. Okay, okay, going on. If you feel up to eating, there's food there. Without looking up from the files, she gestures towards the convenience store bag sitting on the nightstand. How did I get here? Koji can't imagine that a woman, even one like Ryoko, could have climbed out of the well with him on her back. There was a sealed door behind one of the bookshelves down there, Ryoko mutters, as though talking to herself. Taking care not to let her explanation interfere with her reading or eating, she continues. It was a pain to break open, but it led to the boiler room underneath the cabin. The other side had been hidden with a thin layer of mortar. He probably sealed it after bringing all his equipment into the secret lab, then used the well to get in and out. Pretty thorough. Was there really something in there that he needed to hide so badly? There used to be. This is the last of it. Having finished her sandwich, Ryoko picks up some unsorted papers with her free hand and waves them in the air. Not all scholars want to get on stage at a symposium and show off their research to the world, you know. There's also nutcases who get their kicks by learning secrets no one else knows, and by being buried with those secrets in hidden tombs that no one will ever find. Koji still hasn't the slightest idea what Ogai's secret might have been. From what Ryoko said in that tunnel, however, he can guess that whatever it is has done something to Fuminori. Fuminori? What happened to him? Koji asks desperately, no longer caring who he gets answers from. What does Fuminori have to do with that dead body down there? Just what is it that you're after? That's what I'm trying to find out, Ryoko replies coldly, as though Koji's concerns are none of hers. Sakisaka-kun told me that he'd been asked to find Ogai by one of Ogai's relatives. Yes, he told me the same thing. Oh. Well, at least that's consistent. Ryoko pulls several sheets of loose-leaf paper from a different file. The truth is that Ogai had no relatives. I thought that Sakisaka-kun was simply lying. However, there was another possibility I should have considered. He might have been tricked by someone claiming to be Ogai's family. 
Yoko pauses, then looks sidelong at Koji. Does the name Saya ring a bell? Saya? No, who's that? Who, or what, is the question. But the more I read, the less I understand. Oh, shit. She sighs bitterly, then returns her attention to the papers in her hand. All I can say for sure is that it appears to have been the focus of Ogai's research. If Sakakun has become deeply involved with whatever Saya is, then he's already past the point of no return. The icy certainty in Ryoko's voice sends a chill down Koji's spine. If so, what will you do with him? He has to ask, even though he already knows the answer. It's like I said, Ryoko replies, smirking at the tension in Koji's voice. I have no idea how many times I've wished I'd had a gun with me one year ago. I won't make the same mistake twice. Badass as fuck. If I go to the police, everything will be over. Ryoko doesn't respond as though she didn't even hear what Koji just said. Fuminori tried to kill me, Koji continues persistently. If I press charges, he'll be arrested and... Ryoko cuts him off harshly. You have witnesses? Proof? What motive did Sakisaka-kun have to kill you? You know, Tano-kun, you're completely misunderstanding what police do. Their job isn't to fight for justice, nor even to keep the people safe. That's true, and there is a uh, court precedent that says the police do not have a legal responsibility to keep you safe. What are you saying? That's in the US at least. There was um, some case where a house was broken into, the police said they'd be there, and then they didn't actually show up, which ended up with the women who were living in the house all getting raped, which which was unpleasant and not fun. So, uh, yeah, if you ever talk to all the wacky gun nuts like me on the internet, they'll always cite that as why you should have some amount of personal defense going rather than just trusting police. But, uh, not to get too deep onto that political note, let's let's continue. Finding reasonable explanations for unreasonable events, that's what police are for. They will always choose to believe the simplest, most logical explanation. It's just like how water always flows downhill. Gotta Occam's razor it. They aren't interested in the truth. They don't know or care that the truth is often stranger than fiction. Surely they're not all like that. I won't know until I try. Exactly, Ryoko states as she pulls another sandwich out of the bag. That's the problem. Oh, I wish Ryoko would make me a sandwich. That's a joke. She hasn't spared Koji a second glance since looking at him earlier. Even while talking, her attention is always focused on the papers in front of her. Let's say you accuse your friend of going crazy and pushing you into a well. In addition to your statement, the police will consider two alternative versions of the truth. Maybe you're making it all up to frame your friend. Or, even simpler, the shock of having fallen into a well by accident has you doubting your friend. These three possibilities will race to see which comes out with the most convincing evidence. No one knows which will be the winner. Are you willing to bet everything you have on your truth? Koji has no response. Can he really logically explain the events that led Fuminori to do what he did? How can, he, how can he convince everyone else when he doesn't even understand it himself? And here's the biggest problem, Ryoko says calmly, cutting into Koji's thoughts. 
While you're raising hell with the police, we'll lose our chance to corner Sakasaka from Minori. If he sees trouble coming, he'll go into hiding to avoid getting caught, and then we'll be back to square one. She pauses to take a bite of her sandwich before continuing. Just like how I let Ogai get away. A heavy silence falls upon them, with only the soft rustle of pages turning in Ryoko's hands, marking the passage of time. Please tell me, Doctor, Koji says, his, his hushed voice breaking through the quiet. What is so unforgivable that you're willing to take justice into your own hands? Just what exactly did Ogai do in that room down there? That's a very reasonable thing to ask. Once again, Ryoko coldly ignores Koji's question. This time, however, Koji doesn't back down. He keeps staring at her relentlessly as she continues to silently immerse herself in the documents. After some time, Ryoko rearranges the papers in her hands and sets them aside as though having come to some conclusion. She then finally turns her whole body towards Koji. Listen, Tonokun. Now that she's finally facing him, Ryoko affixes Koji with a firm stare that belies the calmness of her voice. You should back out of this now. Go relax at Nonsense somewhere in Nasu or Nikko, and don't return to Tokyo until you're ready to forget all of this. I am sure I mispronounced all of that. Forget? Onsens are the public baths, I believe? After disbelievingly repeating Ryoko's command, Koji feels quiet, yet irrepressible anger rising within him. Omi was my girlfriend, and Fuminori was my best friend. You're telling me to forget about them. Yeah, forget about them, Koji replies, coolly rebuffing Koji's anger. This isn't a suggestion, it's a warning. Whatever their relationship to you might have been, that's all over now. You'll never see them again, I guarantee it. Then what about Tsukuba? Koji practically shouts. What'll happen to her? She was begging me for help on the phone. Something terrible was happening to her somewhere. And how many hours ago was that? Do you know how much time has passed since I saved you? How much longer do you think you would have lasted down there if I hadn't? She shakes her head, then coldly says, It's too late. She's already dead. You shouldn't expect everyone to be as lucky as you. You, Koji growls, unable to suppress his anger. If you'd found me dead in that well, you wouldn't have thought anything of it, would you? I was prepared for that, of course, Ryoko says with a shrug, unfazed by Koji's ire. I hardly expected to find you alive. Once again, Koji has been made painfully aware of the futility of arguing with this woman. No matter how hard he tries, he'll never be able to make her feel shame or reform her ways. It's meaningless to debate with someone whose morals are fundamentally different. Koji gets out of bed and stands on his shaky legs. How long have I been asleep? About half a day. I envy your ability to recover from exhaustion so quickly. It's a privilege of the young, so enjoy it while it lasts. Koji looks at his watch and sees that it's 4am, which means that it was already early evening when Ryoko rescued him. He can't believe that he survived sitting in that well for almost two days. Now that the gaps in his memory have been filled in and his sense of time has returned, he realizes that it's already Sunday morning. Ryoko's right, a lot of time has passed since he spoke to Yo on Saturday. Koji grabs a sports drink and two jellied nutritional snacks from the pack of food that Ryoko brought, then heads for the door. He's still unsteady on his feet, but he can manage through force of will. Just to make sure, mind telling me where you're going? Tokyo, Koji replies brusquely, his tone no less hard than Ryoko's. Tsukuba might still be alive. I'm going to save her. 
You just don't listen, do you? I could say the same to you. Koji's expecting Ryoko to watch him go with that cold, mocking smile of hers. Instead, however, she sighs heavily and rests her jaw in her hands. Can't you wait a little longer? Somewhere in here, she thrusts her chin at the mountain of papers in front of her, is the answer to what this thing Ogai called Saya is. I think we should wait until I figure that out and come up with a plan to defeat it. You would think that, since you're already convinced that Skuba is dead. In truth, Koji is extremely uneasy about going on alone. He knows, however, that even if he did have Ryoko's help, she would surely bring about the worst possible end. He mustn't depend on her. Tonokun, Ryoko calls just as Koji opens the door and steps into the hallway. You were almost killed once. Don't let it happen again. She picks up something that was lying next to her pile of documents and casually tosses it to Koji. When Koji catches it, he feels its solid weight fill his hand. This is... Koji stares at the menacing shape of cold metal. It's a revolver, the one that was clenched in Ogai's skeletal fist. Sadly, I do not know... Um, handgun models very well at all, so can't identify what exactly this is, but there is that Smith & Wesson logo there. Or the Japanified to obscure the actual company logo equivalent. Alright, let's go on. It has four more shots. There's no safety, so you just need to pull the trigger to fire. Where and how to use it is up to you. If Koji were his usual cautious self, he probably wouldn't hesitate to reject the dangerous offering. The only end a gun can decisively bring is absolute ruin. He doesn't intend to go back to Tokyo to fight a losing war. However, without even knowing it, Koji has already set foot into Ryoko's world. Choosing instinct over reason, he accepts the small but deadly weapon and stuffs it into his pocket. There's no question that Koji intends to save Yo and bring Fuminori to answer for his sins. In the back of his mind, however, he clearly hears the footsteps of destruction approaching. When he steps out of the cabin's front door, Koji shivers at the cold of the dawn forest. The freezing wind swooping across the front yard is like knives against his skin. He can't believe that the outside air is even colder than the mud at the bottom of the well. The cold of night must have been lessened by the stagnant air filling the cramped space. If he'd been exposed to this intense chill all night long, he would surely have frozen to death. Koji finds two cars parked at the end of the road leading to the front yard. The mini car next to his Accord must be Ryoko's. When he sits behind the wheel of his car, he gets some relief from the feeling that he has taken the first step, however small, back into his world. He takes small sips of the sports drink, wetting his parched throat, then washes down some jello. His stomach rebels at the sudden influx of food after 36 hours of emptiness, but he manages to force down the urge to vomit. Koji needs the energy. No matter how hard it is, he must regain enough stamina to overcome the challenges ahead. After forcing down the necessary amount of food, Koji leans back in his seat and takes a short break. Now that he's begun to feel like himself again, he reaches into the back seat and pulls his spare cell phone out of his bag. He never expected that accidentally carrying two phones would be such a stroke of luck. As he calls up Fuminori's number and prepares to hit send, Koji is overcome by a flood of emotions. Rage, despair, sorrow, pity, he's unable to decide what to feel towards his friend. However, there's no time for such idle worries. Every second loss diminishes the chance of saving Omi and Yo. Koji refuses to even consider that it may already be too late. He steals himself and presses the button, then holds the phone to his ear as it rings longer and louder than ever before. 
Right now, Fuminori's phone must be displaying the name of the caller. Koji wonders what Fuminori's reaction will be when he sees it. The call goes through. Koji can clearly sense suspense, apprehension, and dark fury coming from the silence at the other end of the phone. Feeling slightly gratified, Koji delivers the first jab. Yo. Yo. What, you weren't expecting a call from a dead man? What a surprise. How did you manage it? As Koji's about to answer, an idea suddenly flashes through his mind. There was a secret passage in the well, Koji says as a plan forms rapidly in his head. It led to a hidden underground room. He pauses to let that sink in, then with the satisfaction of having taken the initiative filling his voice, says, I met Ogai Masahiko, you know. Fuminori's gasp makes it clear that Koji has seized the advantage completely. Keeping his voice fearless, he decides to further exaggerate the truth. I know it all. Everything about Saya. You're finished, Fuminori. I've got all the proof I need to blow this thing wide open. You won't even see it coming. You bastard. It's obvious from the sound of Fuminori's voice that rage has overwhelmed his reason. Koji's hit or miss bluff appears to have worked perfectly. His victory is tainted, however, as Fuminori's extreme response to the word Saya brings a cry of pain from the traces of friendship still hiding in the depths of his soul. If Sakisaka has become deeply involved with whatever Saya is, Ryoko's cold words play back in his head, sounding even more pitiless than before. Then he's already past the point of no return. He mustn't allow himself to be overwhelmed by useless emotions. Fuminori, Muraomi, and Skuba. Koji suddenly switches topic strength to keep Fuminori off balance. It all comes down to this. Even I might be willing to show you mercy, depending on how you act, that is. If you swear not to cause any more suffering, I'll forget about what you did to me, and what I found at that cabin. I don't want to have anything more to do with you and Saya anyway. All I want is for Omi and Yo to be safe. Omi and Yo, huh? Fuminori's voice trails off, but it's obvious that he's desperately trying to decide whether or not he can trust Koji's words, and whether or not there's room for negotiation. Fuminori has been called out, and now it's time for him to show his hand. I truly don't know anything about Omi. She never came to my house. Yo, however... Fuminori pauses, then gives a knowing chuckle that sends chills up Koji's spine. Well, I wonder if she'll really want to leave. She's with you, isn't she? Koji's relief to learn Yo's location and that she is, at least, alive. At the same time, however, it's now clear that Fuminori had something to do with the suffering that Koji had heard Yo going through over the phone. Had Yo already fallen into Fuminori's trap back then? What's happened to her? How is she being treated? She's finally had her deepest desire granted, you know, Fuminori says with venomous sarcasm. She's my property now. It looks like you and Omi got what you wanted after all. Koji feels despair settling over his soul. How much lower will this man go, Koji wonders. Must Fuminori seek out and destroy every memory of the friendship that they'd once shared? Let Skuba go. When I'm sure she's safe, I'll destroy everything I have on you and Saya. How can I trust you? First, I want you to... I'm not giving you a choice here, Fuminori. Koji instinctively realizes that it's dangerous to push his bluff any further. I'll call you again later. You have until then to make up your mind. He hangs up without waiting for a response. 
Fuminori doesn't know that Koji is still at the cabin in Tochigi. Right now, he's probably worrying about whether Koji will show up in an hour or a minute. Koji hopes that he'll be able to take advantage of Fuminori's confusion. Three hours. That's how long it'll take to race all the way back to Tokyo. Koji is afraid that his body won't allow him to maintain the concentration necessary for such a long drive. His mind is clear, but his limbs still feel half asleep, like they're weighted down with lead. Although he knows that he has to stay resolute, Koji still longs for the life that he had until a few days ago. Back then, life or death conflicts were the furthest thing from his mind, and he'd never imagined that he might be fighting for someone's life. With each passing moment, he feels himself becoming less like the person he was. When all of this is over, will he be able to return to his normal life? Or will this change continue until it has consumed him and his world? Time is against him. Every second that passes is wasted. Even so, he decides to allow himself just five minutes of weakness. For exactly five minutes, he leans against the steering wheel and cries. And when his tears have run dry and his heart is calm, Koji starts up his accord and drives away. And back to Fuminori's perspective, complete with sounds. Yep. I stare at the silent phone for a while. There's anger, of course, but something cold and heavy holds my emotions in check. The sense of danger. To be honest, I'm surprised at how calmly I'm handling this. Surprise. Master? Oh dear. Yo looks up apprehensively for, from where she was attending to my manhood throughout the call. Perhaps mistaking my silence for annoyance, she desperately rubs her breast against my shaft and attacks the head of my penis with her tongue. The remaining fragments of her memory seem to have joined together as she has regained some degree of speech. Upon realizing this last night, Saya immediately began to teach her language once more, finding it amusing to teach her pet new tricks. Don't be mad. Yo will try harder. Still gazing up at me pleadingly, Yo sucks on my penis without even taking the time to breathe. Her ministrations threaten to fill my hell with my head with a white fog of pleasure that would impede my thoughts, and besides, my arousal has already vanished. At first, I consider making her stop. When I gaze into her puppy dog eyes, however, I begin to think differently. Thanks to Saya's efforts, I have a family once again. For the first time, I'm becoming aware of the responsibility that places on me. I'm now the head of a new Sakisaka household, as well as its only male member. It's my duty to protect, to comfort, and to ensure the happiness of the women living under my roof. With that in mind, I know I mustn't carelessly show any fear or confusion. Continue, yo. Yes. I entrust my manhood to Yo's right breasts, basking in the pleasure with one part of my mind while contemplating our current predicament with the other. It is clear that I made a grave, irredeemable error when I failed to finish Koji off two days ago. Right now, I need to set my frustration and anger aside and deal with this problem logically. It's time to leave. I have no way of knowing when Koji escaped from the well, how much he has learned, or how many people he has had contact with since then. Now that it's impossible to know how far the problem has spread, simply disposing of Koji again won't guarantee our safety. Right now, Koji is like poison in a reservoir. No matter what, it will never be possible to filter all of the poison out of the water. What should one do in this situation? The answer is obvious. Stop drinking the water. The only choice is to find a new place to drink and start a new life. Fuminori, who were you talking to? Saya returns from the kitchen where she'd gone in search of a midnight snack. She's munching on her favorite, spare ribs. Very cute. Purging myself of unease and impatience, I respond with a casual shrug. It looks like we have a little trouble. That bastard Koji is still alive. Oh dear. By breaking the news suddenly and without any trace of anxiety, I'm able to avoid frightening Saya or putting her on edge. 
Instead, she goes straight to being surprised. Saya, it might be best if we leave this house. Mm, I see. Saya lowers her eyes and strokes her chin thoughtfully. Despite the severity of the situation, of which Saya is no doubt fully aware, she's gone straight to the planning stage without wasting time getting upset. I knew that remaining calm would work. Moreover, I'm currently getting my penis sucked by Yo. It wouldn't be hard for anyone to get too serious under these circumstances. Well, either way, this area would have gotten dangerous once people realized that Suzumi-sen's family has disappeared. I think this day would have come sooner or later. Yeah, Saya nods. I can tell that she's reluctant to leave, but at least there's no sadness in her expression. Everything will be fine. In this way, I will continue to protect my life with Saya. I have that power. Knowing that we've overcome one problem gives me a new confidence. By the way, Saya, I'm almost... Wait, wait! Saya hastily discards her spare ribs and pushes the still-sucking yo off of me. Fuminori, you're harder from Yo's breasts than you are when you're with me. She sounds so upset. Well, that's... Despite her scolding tone, Saya gently and passionately wraps her mouth around my manhood. With my orgasm already charged up by Yo, Saya's ravenous tongue and throat push me over the edge instantly. Saya, I'm... Before Saya finishes, I thrust deep into her throat and unleash my lust as I stare into her eyes, wide with surprise. Even while moaning around my penis, Saya grabs me firmly by the waist and swallows all of my seed without choking. Congratulations, Saya. You go. That was good. You're so greedy, Saya, I say, smiling wryly as I look at Yo, who's lying limply on the floor. You always keep it all for yourself. Of course, I won't forgive you if you give it to any other women. After baring her teeth at me grumpily, she burrows her face into my stomach. I'm serious, okay? It's adorable how Saya goes from angry to pleading like this. I find myself reaching down to muss up her hair. Don't worry, I won't. Now then, we'd better get ready. Okay. We can travel light and borrow the Suzumi family car. I'd better withdraw everything that's left in my bank account and carry it as cash. I'll also need a weapon, something more reliable than a butcher's knife. Koji will most likely follow. He still thinks that Yo can be saved, after all. However, I'm not abandoning this house just to run away. Now that Koji knows our location, staying in one place will put us on the defensive. I'm not about to do something so foolish. I need to find a way to regain the initiative and deal with Koji at a place of my own choosing. The next time we meet, I'll kill him with my own hands. I'll make sure to wring every last drop of life out of his body. A shiver runs through me as I anticipate the battle ahead and my bloodlust feels like orgasmic fire filling my loins. This... this... description. And, um, I'm going to call episode 7 there, as we've been going for quite a while, just as we are snapping back to Ryoko's perspective right here. Looks like we are um, building up to a confrontation between Fuminori and Koji. And Ryoko and Saya are there on the sidelines too. But that is something to record a different day. Hope you guys have been enjoying this series of videos. This episode, we are getting fairly close to the end of the game actually so um hope you're excited because that's what's gonna happen see you then <laughs>